to our face first Facebook live parent meeting. We're excited to be here tonight. Yes, welcome everyone. This is our first time doing this, and so um, yeah, we'll just see how it goes. <laughs> Bear with us, but we're excited to be here with you guys, um, whether you're watching us live or doing it as a replay. But we just thought that this would be a neat option for those of you who it's hard to get to a meeting and find childcare and you know put on jeans with buttons and all that. <laughs> there are benefits. That's right. So then you can do it from your the comfort of your home. So we hope it works out really well. Yeah. Well, it's an experiment. So we hope you enjoy this experiment with us. So we, um, yeah, should we start yeah, talking on the topic? Or? Yeah, we're going to go ahead and dive in here. And if you um, miss anything, then you can always watch it again later. Yeah. So we entitled it um, Fall in Love with Planning. And we do hope that you will enjoy planning. Uh, some people think, oh, it's so stressful or whatever. And we just want you to um, take to give you some tips on taking the stress out of it just to enjoy it. I think one of the great things about planning is you can veer from the plan yep. and know that you can go back to your plan. So what we're going to talk about tonight is basically two things. Um, one is uh, we're talking about what we're going to do. So planning what we're going to do, right? So we're right. Gonna, the, part one will be what are we going to do? When and this is, why. Right. Yeah. But first of all, with the what is for next year. What are we going to do next yes. year, right? For homeschooling. And then how are we going to do it? Okay, and how are we going to do it? So that's the two parts we want to talk about. But actually, right now, um, we want to talk about is, because someone asked us this today. <laughs> they said, well, why do we bother planning? Yeah, why plan? What's the benefit? Why not just buy some curriculum and kind of dive in and why spend the time? Yeah, so then actually it was I woke up from a little snooze and I thought why do we plan and so I jotted it down and it's basically the first one was if you're traveling to Vancouver and you don't have a plan how to get there it's gonna be tough to arrive right. so then the one thing is why do we plan is to help us to get where we want to go yeah. and so um, that's pretty huge the second uh, reason why I was thinking why do we plan is because to give us peace yes Okay, so if we have a plan, then, then we do feel a peace and we also have a certain confidence. Uh, when we have a plan, we, we feel like we know where we're going yeah. and then we can relax and enjoy it, right? When we do our home visits now, you know, often people talk about planning for the next year and you can just see oh, that kind of sigh of relief when they have that basic plan of what are we going to do next year? Yeah. So. And then number three, why do we plan is... Um, it's, it can be fun. I love planning. And lots of times people think, oh, you know, I'm kind of um, not such a structured person and kind of free-flowing person, but I still love planning. Yeah. And when you have some topics that you know you're going to do next year, if you see you're in a store, or you're with friends or whatever, and you see a great book, then you, you oh, you're going to add to that. And it kind of gets your excitement. And your excitement will, will um, you know, it, not wear off, but... You know, well, pass on to your kids. kids. And yeah. I talk to my kids, oh, next year, guys, we're going to do this. And, you know, it kind of gets them excited about it, too, and looking forward to yeah. What, yeah. what's coming. So. Well, that's the thing. And, and certainly part of it is enjoying them telling you what, what, what do you guys want to yeah. plan. So it's fun to incorporate, you know, get them in the swing of it and get them excited about planning, yeah. too. So why else do we plan? Is we wouldn't get much done. Uh, lots of times. I was thinking about tonight. Well, it's sunny out tonight. We could go do a lot of things. But if we didn't have a commitment that uh, we we're going to be here and do it, then uh, then we might not do it. So if you plan something, you get a little more done because you have a commitment to yeah. it, right? So the other thing is that I, I have to think of, uh, wanted to share with you is that uh, my husband, Daryl, he used to always say about planning a trip. And it, going on a trip, he said, you know, a lot of the fun is planning for it, yeah. and then looking at the pictures afterwards. And so we always kind of laughed about that. Not that the trip wasn't fun, but you plan all the good things you're going to do, where you're going to go, where you're going to stop, what, how you're going to do it. And then uh, when you're actually on the trip, it's quite a bit of work. We went across Canada with four kids, so, uh, and camping. Camping, yeah. in a tent. For 52 nights. So I kind of never wants to tent anymore. Yeah. No. <laughs> but anyways, uh, so, you know, it was... Um, 
it was it took some planning and it was a lot of work people got tired and all that kind of stuff but after we came home we looked at the pictures and we thought that trip um, with our family across Canada was worth it and uh, so yeah planning is fun looking at the pictures afterwards is fun and so we're going to talk about that and then doing it is a little harder but yeah it'll be you'll well, be glad I think you it get. ties in with school too because I love planning our school and sometimes my picture of how it's going to be when we do it is a little rosier than the actual doing it. You know, sometimes there's tears or, you know, we're all moms, we know how that goes. But when we're done the project and the kids look and say, wow, we did this or, oh, that was so cool. Or remember when we learned about that? So I think that kind of ties into the vacation analogy there. Yeah. So good. All right. Okay. So when we're talking about planning now and what we're going to do is I'm going to hold up our home education plan. For you to see and many of you will recognize it and are familiar with it and um, the we're going to use this as a little bit of a skeleton or outline for what are we going to do next year because we have to fill this out anyway so we thought well let's just use this so what are we going to do next year and and I think what helps with looking at and using this is I think sometimes when people start planning their year it's really overwhelming but by using this and do a rough draft before you you know have something if that works for you but what's nice is it helps you kind of get an overall picture I think we get a little too focused on the day-to-day -day or the details when we're thinking about planning and that can um, kind of freeze us so if we can get an overall picture of what resources we want to use that kind of gives us a good first step in our planning process. Okay, so we're going to talk about the core subjects right now because, um, yeah, we just can't talk about everything tonight. Okay. And so the core subject, we're going to start with the, where it says math. And so the reason we're going to do math is because math is uh, well, sort of an easier one to do it. Most people use some kind of a program for math. And so um, that's why we thought, well, let's put that in. And that's one quadrant done. There's four spots. So. Yeah. And so, you know, kind of two of the really popular programs that we see a lot of people using for math are the teaching textbooks. I use it with my kiddos and we really like it. And the other popular one is um, Math UC. So yeah, those are yeah. two popular ones that we see. And there's others like uh, Saxon Math for grades four and up. Yeah. That's, that's popular as well. And, and then there's lots of other workbooks that people like, right? Yeah. And so, but generally it's a program because it goes A to B, right? And you right. learn. So then you write down in your math what you're going to use. You can also add things like practical math ideas, games. Sometimes people read The Life of Fred. Sometimes uh -huh. they use that solely, but sometimes they do it with a program in too. In conjunction, so. the Math yeah. Seeds program mm -hmm. um, that you get in conjunction with the Reading Eggs has been really popular, especially because it's something that kids can work through fairly independently. And so that's been a really great way for the kids kind of grades pre-K through third grade is um, perfect for that age group. So, yeah. So yeah. can everyone just give us a little thumbs up and say whether you can hear us uh, clearly or not? Sure. There should be a little thumbs up or you could just, you should be able to do comments there and um, Oh, Horizons is great for starting. Yes, I actually ag totally agree with Susan. Um, we use Horizons math um, prior to getting into the teaching textbooks, which right. starts in grade three. So I totally agree yeah. with that. So yeah. perfect. Yeah. And you can comment um, as Susan did there. So that's kind of fun. That's what makes it a little bit more interactive than just doing the video. It's like you're right here. <laughs> Only you can have your slippers and all that. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, if you have, um, Questions, just go ahead and type them up there as we go. And if we miss it because we're talking, then we will just type again later and we'll try to get it to you. So, okay, so that's, um, you know, we're going to go quickly through that. Yeah. That's a touch on math. And then the next quadrant in the plan that we talk about planning is we're going to talk about social and science because those are something that you might do together or, or not, yeah. right? And so, we're, but that's the next area we're going to talk about yeah. planning. And so, um, you know, everybody does things that works, you know, for their family. I know for us, we try to do social and studies, um, social studies and science together as much as possible because it's something we can combine. The kids are you can teach, and they both get things at their own level. So, yeah. um, one thing that you know I've really had good success with for social studies is the sunlight curriculum. Um, 
and it kind of covers geography, history, Bible, and they have different levels. And I just kind of find something in the middle for both of our for both of my school age children, and we kind of go through that. And that I mean takes a lot of the questions out of planning because they've got great books, um, great resources, and they have a plan that you can follow if it encourages you to follow their kind of daily and weekly plan. If it brings you stress, don't use it. It's yeah. okay. You can use their great book recommendations and suggestions in a way that works for you without, right. you know, having the stress of following it. So, right. I think. And so for also social uh, studies program, um, one thing is just Osborne books. Yes. Right? If, if you guys love Osborne books, yeah, like we do too, right? Actually, when um, back in the day when my kids were little, I was a little um, almost hesitant to use Osborne because um, until one, because there's so many words on the yeah. page and there, it looks so busy and it was overwhelming, too many words. So then um, with the uh, Osborne, someone, well, it was probably in sunlight, but once said, do two pages a day. Yeah. And so we had our Osborne books, we'd read two pages a day and I thought, I can do that. So we read our two pages a day and you do that consistently and you get to read a lot. And uh, so that was, I love Osborne books, so that's great for social studies too. Yeah. No, those are good. Um, some of you are familiar with Jamie Martin, and she wrote a book called Give Your Child the World, and I cannot recommend it enough. It mm. is just a lovely book, and basically it tells Jamie's story. They have a multicultural family, and so it shares her story, but it also is just a rich resource of books, um, including fiction, a lot of fiction, chapter books, picture books, she has it divided by ages, um, but she has it based on the continent. So she'll have, you know, her North America chapter, her Europe chapter, and the book recommendations are just lovely. And truly, that could be an entire social studies curriculum, just mm -hmm. reading these beautiful books, and so many of them, some I'd heard of, but many of them I hadn't. So to have that resource um, is just it's incredible. So yeah, yeah, that's a great, a great way to approach social yeah. studies. So the other, um, if your children get to be a little older, starting about grade three, four, and up, up to you know high school even, uh, social studies. The popular one is uh, the What in the World, mm -hmm. and we have level one, level two, and the Canadian Reader. I think is for three to five. But uh, What in the World is a current events issue, and if you are interested in that, um, yeah. It, that, it's a good one to do. I just see here uh, the name of the book again was Give Your Child the World and you can get it as a hardback or also on Kindle. I recommend getting the actual book. It's just nice to have the pages to flip. So yeah. Yeah and it was Jamie Martin. Jamie Susan. Martin. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that was what in the world, give your child the world. Um, and I think what's neat about doing um, social studies this way is, um, and then also I'm going to talk about science in just a second, but we pull that into our morning time. So that's a time mm -hmm. where we join together. Um, we've talked lots about that in the group this last year. So, but anyways, we... Um, we read books together and we can read a variety of books and it's just kind of, it's a, a learning time and a bonding time. So yeah, those are some ideas for social studies. For, before, to, oh, go ahead. The, just before we get into science is the, and this relates to both, yeah. but um, some people just for, they love to read books, but they want a little bit of a plan, a little bit of guidance. And so um, some people use it really well and it's, it might look a little bare bones, but, uh, but in fact, it, it can be used effectively, and that's the Canadian curriculum. Yes, yeah. And it's a complete cur Canadian curriculum workbooks, um, and they come in, um, what do they do? In, well, there, you, you can get the complete one has math, social studies, science, and I think it's just a great jumping off point right. for a lot of those topics. So when we talk about planning, and if you're not sure, but you want something, but you want flexibility to study, as things come up, yeah. then in your plan could be the Cana uh, Canadian complete book, curriculum book. And um, they they just have uh, lots of ideas and so it can go off and then people use them well in that they look it up, they Google search, get more information. They use Brain Pop. Brain Pop right. is a really popular um, subscription we have using videos. So yeah. that, that's a great you know five minute video and quiz on a topic. So. It's, yeah, that's a great way to do it. And sometimes it's nice too, you know, you can read these lovely books together and then sometimes dad or someone says, oh, well, like, what do you have to show us? And it's kind of, the Canadian curriculum can be good for that because then right. it gives you, yeah, a little yeah. something to show from. So. so everyone will find 
their spot. So when, when we suggest these things, it doesn't mean we're suggesting to use all of them. Right. We're certainly not. We're just um, throwing out ideas. You're, you're going to be homeschooling most likely more than one year. Your children, you know, they don't graduate in a year. So then you'll have, have time. And so you try one thing out, see how it works. And then you go on and you can try something else another year. Yeah. So when we throw out these ideas, we don't want you to feel stressed or overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. We want you to feel like, um, hey, that's a good idea. Yeah. I might use that sometime. And to feel empowered by it. You know, these curriculums, yeah. they are tools. And we're going to talk more about that later. But you can pick bits and pieces out like the Canadian curriculum. They're not expensive. Mm -hmm. So pick some bits and pieces. And if it makes you feel better, rip the pages out that you're going to do and stick it in a binder. And then you can have a showcase of the things that you've done yeah. instead of a book of half the things that weren't applicable to right. you. So. <laughs> half full cup. Right. Half full versus half empty. Okay. Science. All right. Science. All right. So for science, um, I really like, do you want me to grab it? Talk about Abeka real quick. I'll okay. Yeah, she's going to grab something and I'm going to talk about Abeka science. So uh, when we t do talk about science is um, uh, when Carla and our kids were little, um, you know, I don't think we introduced yourself. I'm Kathy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and this is Carla yes. Cannon, and she's my daughter. Yeah. And it gives me great delight to work with Carla. It's pretty special. We have a lot of fun. So, and it's neat because a lot of these things I used growing up, and they of course have new and you know improved things. But these Abeka books are something that we really like. They're textbooks, but they're not. This is the grade four one, so it's not particularly thick and I mean they're just great they have lovely um, pictures in them just a nice amount of text you know here was something about birds and what I like about these ones is that they cover a variety of topics so it's you know everything from geology to um, insects to plant life and you know they do all of that lots on animals lots right? on animals in and grades like one to six particularly yes. yeah so anyways these are great books and one of the other things that i we, my daughter uses it she reads it independently and then we talk about it together we don't do worksheets or anything with it but um i also think it's great for nonfiction reading you know it's good for them we tend to sometimes use a lot of fiction so it's nice to do the nonfiction reading and how that ties in with our morning time and my son who's just in grade one is we also use the mystery science program and those are you know experiments sometimes we'll get little books from the library and so often you know she's talking about hearing and sound and reading about that in her abeka book then we'll do hearing and sound experiments through the mystery science and just kind of tie it in with his level of stuff too yeah so and Hi, Natalie. I see that you have joined us as well. And what I had meant to say earlier is um, when we're talking about planning and giving ideas, it can tend to be for the younger years. But um, I know with Natalie and her girls being um, on the upper grades now, yeah. um, it doesn't have to change. Like, I know that there's pressure to do other things, and that's another topic. But when we talk about ABECA science, um, I know we used, um, Mark, our boys in particular, used ABEC um, uh, biology and science in high school and they really liked that too. And we didn't, I didn't uh, so much make them memorize it and all that, but it was just a, an enjoyable read. Um, and, and exposure. Yeah, and they did do some of the quizzes too, but they were older, right? Yeah, another thing that we talk about for older grades is the apologia. Right, okay, um. so the, um, Apologia, they sometimes call that elementary science. And I look at it and think grade one, two, and three, that's pretty tough slugging. Um, <laughs> and there's one on anatomy, there's one on night creatures, flying creatures. Uh, astronomy. Astronomy, sea life, right? Yeah. And the thing with those, they, they say it's elementary, but for sure, I think it's like grades four to eight. Yeah. That's, that's I, I mean, yeah, I'd read it now and I'm an adult, actually. Um, but anyway, so yeah. Um, a Becca is spelled, just to answer a question here, it's A and then capital B E K A. And I normally you can order from them or from ChristianBooks.com, has all their stuff. So. Right. Because most places, you have to directly order directly from them. Yes. Or like you said. Or from Christian Books. So yeah, so Apologia is great. All right. And one thing that, one last thing that we wanted to mention about social studies and science is that we do not do, I don't do both every day. 
or mm -hmm. even every week because that can get a little bit overwhelming if you try to cram it all in one day. So we flip flop anywhere from day to day, sometimes week to week. Um, yeah. How we did it growing up was... Well, and we also, when we talk about the, the different possible curriculums, we also did unit studies it. And yeah. so lots of times when I was planning as our kids were um, homeschooling that we would do from month to month. So one month we would study... Um, Vikings. You know, yeah, the Vikings. Okay, thank you. <laughs> she remembers. She yes. did it. And then another month we maybe studied insects. Yeah. Uh, then the next month maybe we picked a country. So it's kind of more social study. So we pick uh, a country. We picked Chile one time in South America and I wrote a song. Yes. And we sang a song about Chile, but we won't sing it to you now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, so the month-to-month -month planning was a social kind of a focus and then a science kind of a focus. Yeah. So. And lots of times they intermix, you know, to a certain degree. Well, absolutely. But... If you're studying Australia, you still learn about all the animals and trees, so, which is science, right? Yeah. So. so, yeah, that's a great way of doing it. All right. Okay. Um, and then you want to transition into some language arts. And... Right. Okay. So then we are talking now. Uh, we have our little uh, plan, our home ed plan that we talked about. And so we've got four core areas. We talked about math, social, and science. And so then we left the last, we only have one quarter left. And so... Um, what good planners you are already. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and it's, yeah. And so now we're going to talk about that area. Yeah. And I said it's sort of like learning your multiplication tables when you are um, learning the, maybe the seven times table is a little bit harder. But when you've already done the twos and the threes and the four, you, you've already know those. It's yeah. sort of like this. You know these and you've only got one quarter left, right? Yeah. Okay, so we are going to talk about transitioning and I have a page that talks about that look at you i know i just have to i was find gonna it. while she gets her page going i was just gonna say too sometimes for our family science is a nice thing to do in the summer you know some science experiments or if you're gonna do that volcano go do it out in the yard or whatever it is so in our family we do a lot of nature study in the summer and so i feel like we kind of hit science a little harder in the summer and then when we're maybe a little bit more social studies focused in the winter i don't feel bad about it because i know that we did those extra things during the year just kind of naturally yeah. as we were in drum heller and we saw all the erosion we're like well what is erosion and so. yeah well that's a very good point and i i agree with it so um back to we're transitioning into language arts now and so on the plan um you think okay language arts is a tougher one how do i plan that well i think if you are doing your social and science together and you're reading um some books and they're reading some things like um and then so you can and then they write about things right yeah and so if you're too heavy into a language arts curriculum then you don't do as many projects and you'll share yeah. about that in a minute but basically uh you can have a lot of your writing assignments um coincide right projects and that about your social and science things that they're interested in and more excited to write about rather than than not so why don't you share yeah. that about Right, so part of my planning, um, when I'm planning my social studies and, you know, the science and whatnot, is I think about, well, what kind of, how could we tie this into our writing, and what kind of writing projects could we do? Um, when, when Naomi was going into third grade, I thought, oh boy, third grade, you know, we kind of got a time to crack down, <laughs> and she's in fourth grade this year, but anyway, so we, I bought a curriculum, a language arts curriculum, and it was fine, it was one of the better ones out there, and we did it. We watched the little instructions, we did the worksheets, and I felt good, because I was a good mom, I had checked those boxes, you know, we mm. had done it, and so I think sometimes we do it for ourselves, because it feels good for us. But at the end of the year, I looked and we didn't have in her previous school years, you know, we had little booklets or little lap books or, or a little poster, you know, they weren't extraordinary, but they were little projects and we mm -hmm. had these things to show. And at the end of her third grade year, I had a pile of worksheets and they weren't inspired writing at Naomi's voice of who she is and her little quirky personality. It didn't show in those worksheet pages. And I just felt like we almost, we kind of missed the boat that year. So what I did this year in her fourth grade year is I thought, okay, forget 
worksheets, not totally, I do use mm -hmm. them, but we um, wanted to do more project-based writing. And so our big unit study this year was Canada. We went through each of the provinces and did a lot of geography and stuff like that. And so when I planned out that social studies unit, and we did some science mixed in there just with the, you know, the type of land and that kind of stuff. And so we did a kind of like a scrapbook for each. It was a one big scrapbook and we did it together, both kids, a first grader and a fourth grader. And, and they did, this was the, not all, but it made up a huge part of our writing this year. I don't know how well you guys can see that. So anyways, you can see here, this was on uh, Quebec. And so I'll lift it up a little bit more on this side. And so we printed out pictures and this was um, writing that Naomi did in fourth grade. My son also in first grade equally contributed to the book, but he did his at his level and he did it as copy work. So we learned things, he would tell them to me, I would write them down and he would copy them. Um, and that was, and so it was his book too. He contributed it and included both of them. So that was just, you know, here's another of Ontario, you know, and we didn't write tons, but the writing I got was they were inspired, they were excited, they had lots to say because we had just learned about it. And I think it increased their learning of the subject too because Absolutely. you know we talked about it in depth. And so, yeah, I was just so pleased with our project-based language arts. Well, yeah, and the other good thing about uh, doing that type of writing is that they were proud of it. And so when yeah. grandma and grandpa, when Daryl and I would come over, they were excited to grab the yeah. book and show us. And, uh, and they have that. For, for keeps, right? Yeah. And it was fun to plan it, but like we talked about later, not every minute when they were doing that work were they skipping and singing, oh, mommy, I'm just so glad you had me write about Quebec today. You know, it wasn't. <laughs> there was moments of learning and growing, of course, too. But now that we have this and we did it, they are so stinking proud of it. Right. And so it makes it worth it. Um, yeah, so it, back to the language arts then, I, I wrote on here is that we on the language arts, we have writing projects, reading, fiction and nonfiction, because language arts is reading and writing. And um, so there we have that, and, you, and copy work. And then we're gonna talk about a few tools um, that will give you some of the basics in there too. Right, because I think sometimes when you buy a big curriculum, it's expensive and you sort of feel obligated to use it. So even though we didn't have for language arts this year, a big curriculum that I purchased, we did have various tools that we used. And so one of the tools for our language arts curriculum was the daily grams. You've heard me talk about them before. It's just a quick one page review on, you know, punctuation, grammar, capitalization, parts of speech. It's super fast. Naomi does it in about, you know, five to seven minutes, depending on the day. And that was one of the tools that we used to practice those skills on a regular basis. Um, some other things that are like, many of you are familiar with the Explode the Code books, especially in the early years. Those are great for learning phonics. Mm -hmm. And so we've used those faithfully for different seasons. But, you know, we didn't do every page every day all year long. Sometimes we hit it hard and then we backed off and did something else. So... Um, some other things. And they don't take that long. And exactly. so if you think about Charlotte Mason and she talks about um, the habit of attentiveness or that we can have our children learn to not be attentive. Yes. And that's uh, giving them things that take too long to do. They cannot, they, they will hate it because they can't focus on that. And so um, the explode the codes are nice because they're short and sweet. And it's particularly, I would say, for little boys. Yes. Girls too, but I know that little boys, it's short, they're done, and they don't have to sit there too long. Yeah. And just while we're on the Explode the Code books, um, for my son Nathan, for his kindergarten and first year, and we'll continue next year, is we use the Sunlight. They have a specific, you can buy their language arts. You know, they can get a big expensive for history and geography, but you can also just purchase their language arts program. And we have loved it. It's so mm -hmm. great if you're teaching kids to read. It uses Explode the Code, but their books that they wrote go along with the Explode the Code program. So when they learn a new vowel and their first reading how to read, you know, words with the awe sound in them, then the story has the awe sound built in. So it's like taking the Explode the Code and just doing one step further mm -hmm. um, by giving extra practice with it and kind of a little more guidance for the parents. So I highly recommend the Sunlight Language Arts program um, for the early years. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, some other things that we've used for a um, little bit older kids, all the way through grade 12, they have Wordly Wise. It's vocabulary that I did them. I think they're great. They don't take very long. Um, so that's something that's been And they're good. useful. I think I've seen more practical uh, that they, driving by, they use the words that they learned. I yes observed uh, at least our kids back in the day yeah no i think it's great and um you know they, they also have some reading and answering some questions and so i think that's good practice too mm -hmm. it's good to be able to answer a question about something you've read um we also everyone knows i'm a big fan of brave writer products so i pull lots of things from brave writer i don't use one specific thing all the time but a great thing if you want to dabble in brave writer a little bit are their um literature study packs that you can buy. They're only $9.99. So it's a steal of a deal. And basically they focus on one book, um, such as we just read The Green Ember. Mm -hmm. And so my fourth grader is um, doing the arrow on the, and it includes, you know, some copy work, some dictation, some things to talk about. So those are great um, in, in an inexpensive way to right. try it. And you're not committed for a whole year. You can do it that one section. And all these, again, are, are shorter ones that so your child can stay attentive and see an end to it. If you're yep. thinking it takes all year, it's a little depressing. Yep, absolutely. So arrow, boomerang, right? From Brave yep. Writer? Boomerang are for the older kids. So, so and then the a little bit older kids was a great editing adventure, yes. right? Yes. So um, I think Carla's starting that this year, yep. right? With Naomi in grade four. And we did going it. Going into grade five. She's oh, going start. into grade yeah. five, right. Because you have to have a basic grasp of some of the rules before you can edit right. them. So, so the, and their stories, and they're kind of fun. And again, it doesn't take that long. Yeah. I would also like to mention um, uh, for people that have older um, kids um, that um, the Time for Writing program, it's yeah. an eight week program. And um, online, it's an online writing class. Right. Yeah. $99 US. And you can um, sign up, and it takes, like we said, eight weeks, yeah. which again isn't. 12 months mm -hmm. and so then you can hit it hard for yeah and it it's a little more more school like yeah but um again mostly for junior high and high school that we've had kids do these and be successful with them and sort of feel like a little more grown up yeah. it gives them something to uh, not be uh that mom has a little bit of freedom for eight weeks because they are, are accountable to uh, the teacher there and stuff. And like it's that. fun to get feedback from someone else too. You know, if you've always gotten mom's feedback, then it's kind of fun to have a teacher look at your writing. Yeah. Stuff. So those are great. And those are time and then the number four writing. Yeah. So. And again, some people do it in grades five and six. I'm more into the junior high, senior high thing. Yeah. All right. And then the last kind of thing that we wanted to talk about with language arts. So, you know, we do stuff built into our social studies or science would be like nature journaling or making. I saw a little second grader today and he did a fantastic job. He made just a little poster on mm. the three types of rocks and, and he did it as copy work. So it was knowledge he had. And then his mom wrote it out and he copied it. And it was fabulous. He was so um, pleased. So those kinds of projects. But we also do things, um, you know, so I have stuff that I can pull out that don't take a lot of prep work is like journaling so my daughter does journaling boys might not be into journaling so what would be like a spin on journaling um spin on journaling okay so um we don't have that plan to talk sorry about. i no. but like okay well one no, thing that say, i say yeah. oh, i'll answer for you i'll answer my own question but like you they could do a how-to you know boys sometimes like right. how i made my bike ramp um, I visited some boys yesterday and I had this really sweet bike ramp. And so that would give them, you know, more than, exactly. you know, oh, the joy I felt Christmas morning, um, which my daughter would love to write about that. But, right. you know, boys could that well, first I took this and I sawed it and, you know, those kinds of things, those count. And that's a great project for boys. So they mm -hmm. could kind of have how-to projects. And um, lots of facts things too. I think yes. that's what I was thinking when you said that is um, 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 boys often like, to write down facts and so if they're reading yeah. a, a, a non-fiction book about astronauts then yeah. they can write some facts about that yeah so that's really good um, you know we talked about nature journaling those can be fun um, some other things are like letters you know lots of um, school curriculum or writing curriculums will you know have a write a letter to a pretend friend about a pretend thing that they never did well it's hard to get excited about that but if they write a letter to grandma or whatever a thank you card or something like that you know that counts don't discount the value of those things because they're they're real and they're more valuable mm -hmm. so 
I was going to say. I'll oh. get her to read my glasses. Oh, Susan them. said a Lego journal with writing and a picture. Yes, boys would love that. Oh, my goodness. This is my Lego creation. And, you know, they have a whole thing they could say about that. So I think that's brilliant. Yeah, good idea. And the when Carla mentioned letter writing, um, we had a grandma who taught school for 35 years. And when they wrote, they did lots of letters to different grandmas. Yeah. And, um, um, but anyway, when they wrote to the grandma that was a teacher for 35 years, they wrote, rewrote it. And so they did it like it was their Sunday best. Yes. And they did a very good job of it. Whereas if they wrote, because people often say, how much do I correct my child? This is another topic, yes. I guess. But, <laughs> but just a brief mention of that is how, when they're writing to you, mommy, I love you. And they spell love you know, L-U-V, then you don't want to correct that. But if they're doing a very special project, then then that's a different yeah. situation. And sometimes how much do you correct? Well, that sometimes it's how much do you help them? Like our book that I show people, you know what? I helped her with the spelling of there because she doesn't want to hold up something she misspelled on Facebook Live. So she had more help with that right. than the journal entry she did about our trip you know, our vacation. I didn't help her as much with that. Right. So sometimes I think that ties Depends on your well. audience. Yeah. But anyways, that's another topic. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All okay, right. So, so we kind of covered the what. We've got our home education plan and we sort of covered the main four quadrants of what are we going to use? Do we all feel better? You know what you're going to use now? <laughs> I think, too, um, sometimes people ask me on that what, mm -hmm. how specific do I have to be? Mm -hmm. And sometimes I have, some people just write under, unit, uh, under social and science unit studies on a variety of topics. And so far, that's been fine to do, too. If you, uh, you know, so you do unit studies, and if you have some samples, then you write your samples of what yeah. you're going to study, m m medieval ages or whatever, right? Yeah. But, Something at times under science, too, I recommend that you put science kits, science experiments, and science classes. Those are good things because often you'll end up getting something like that as the year comes, and then it's already on your plan. So. Perfect. Okay, so yes, that is kind of the what, right? Yeah. What are we going to use? And that's kind of our big picture of what are we going to use. And it's funny because before we did this, I thought, geez, I should do some planning for next year because we're going to be talking about planning. Right. So I picked out some curriculum, and then I started to kind of plug it into, okay, well, how am I going to do this? And then I called my mummy, and I said, mummy, like, how do I fit it all in? Mm -hmm. I can't. There's all these great resources, but how do we make it work in reality in our day-to-day? -day? So that's kind of our how, our second part here. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, first of all, I've got to say hi to Holly. Hi, Holly. I see you're here. Holly lives far away in Hinton. Not in Hinton, but near Hinton. And I'll think of the name soon. So, anyways, it is um, the how. The am, I, am I supposed to be talking now or are you? Well, you, but I can talk too. Okay. One of the things that she was going to talk about now... <laughs> Well, Mom, we did a lot of unit studies growing up, and so that's been really neat. And so when she did it, she talked about how she kind of planned. And I did this when I was teaching, actually. We did unit studies, and we kind of planned month by month um, with an overall theme for the month. Right, so, right. That's, that's what, what, what gonna I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I sort of had mentioned that before, um, uh, that the month-to-month -month thing is a... Is a a doable thing and it didn't mean that I spent the whole month on it but if we were studying um, uh, medieval ages or something then we, w that month was full yeah I remember that was a very popular one um, but then again you could um, save things and find things and we had on our shelf or in a box I had those things and so I like the month to month planning yeah Something that you, oh, was there more about nope, that? No, that's okay. Good. Something that you hear about uh, kind of the popular buzzword right now when I'm looking on blogs and stuff is you'll hear loop scheduling. And I think loop scheduling is kind of, the idea is neat, is basically you're taking something and you're just rotating through it. And different people approach it in different ways, you know, for things like um, maybe like picture study or poetry or Shakespeare, you know, those are things that you're not necessarily going to do every day or every month. And so people have different approaches to them. You know, some people say, all right, well, on Monday we do music study. On Tuesday we do poetry tea time and they'll loop through su subjects in that way. Um, whereas other people will say, okay, for, you know, this next two months, we're going to do Shakespeare. We're going to read it. We're going to memorize a couple things. We're really going to delve into some Shakespeare and then we're going to be done with him. And I found for my 
kids and my personality, but that kind of looping works well on some of those topics. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not a whole necessarily a unit study, but we'll kind of dive into something. Right now we're learning about Monet and some of his paintings, but we didn't do it a little bit every week. We are doing it now for a month and then we'll move on to something else. So that's kind of, um, yeah, a buzzword that you'll hear quite a bit these days is the loop scheduling. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, um, did you have more there? No, nope, I think so. I, all right. I also kind of jotted down for Naomi when I'm doing my planning for her, speaking of the kind of the loop scheduling, is I did sort of a, like day one, day two, day three, as opposed to doing days of the week, because I find, you know, Monday, Tuesday, you're always pretty motivated, and then it gets a little weak come <laughs> Thursday, Friday. So when I plan for her, I kind of did these four days of, you know, different things, like she does math a little bit all year, so she didn't have to do it every day of the week. So certain days she'll do copy work or certain days she'll do dictation. And so I just kind of wrote up like a day one, day two, and then when I'm writing out for her what I want her to do that day, I don't give her this, this would overwhelm her, but it, sometimes I refer to it and say, oh gosh, what haven't we done for all, oh good, typing, we haven't done typing in a few days, and then I'll add it to her list. Um, right now you'll hear a lot about spiral notebooks, it was a term coined by Sarah McKenzie. Mm. And so that has been working really well for us. I will write down um, what I want her to do. Like just in this little, I just, I got a small spiral notebook because we don't need a big one. That was too much. So just one of these little ones. And I just write down the date and what I want her to do, which is I put a circle and then she fills in the circles. And um, it's been great for us. It helps me kind of keep a pulse on how much I want her to do by writing it out it kind of like oh gosh that's going to be a little bit much for today and she loves it because then she knows what's expected of her in any given day mm -hmm. so that's kind of helped us with the how we do it and then when I'm looking at what curriculum we want I'm like oh okay this will work or oh actually in the day-to-day -day, that would be too much mm -hmm. so why don't you talk about what we did okay. a little bit when we so, were growing up right when um when we were homeschooling we didn't have a lot of the great podcasts and Blogs. Facebook live <laughs> meetings. And so, but I had a husband who liked making charts. And so I would tend to, I found it helpful and he made us a chart. He said we didn't use it all the time, but we again went in cycles. Yeah. But, and we did use the days of the week. Yeah. So that was a little bit different, but um, that it fit our schedule. So you yeah. can choose. And here's a little chart that he made and he made this for me again um, so I could show it. And we actually included all the days of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, uh, because we felt like um, we all, you know, we always learn any day. It doesn't have to be yeah. just a certain day, right? And so um, then we wrote down the main things on the side. They'd write their name and the week. And then on the side, we had math, reading, writing, social, Bible, I don't think they exercise, see sorry. And yeah. then whatever happened the last. You can't see it, but I can't either. At chores, we always put chores on our chart too. So then they would fill in, um, you know, whatever whatever they were going to do. And Wednesday, we like Carla said, their first two days of the week we tended to do quite well. And um, so then Monday, Tuesday were, you know, star days. And then we were all tired out. And so then Wednesday, and that's why band homeschool band is on Wednesdays. To this day. To this day, because. <laughs> Wednesdays we were all ready for something different. Yeah. You, you need to break it up a bit. And so um, then we had our band day, we did our grocery, or our town day, we did our errands, and you know met with friends and stuff like that, field trips. So then we worked Thursday, Friday. But we included exercise because we felt that was a good thing for them to do it, and then we'd fill that in too. And when math, um, they'd write the lesson, and then they'd check it off. And so it was easier for me, especially when you have multiple children, you have uh, three or four children or more or more than that and then they could check it off and it was uh, it was a peaceful thing because it kept um, kept things organized yeah and from my perspective too and I was actually telling a friend of mine about this because you know this the spiral work notebook thing works for me but for some people it does not work to write it out every day that sounds awful to them it works for me because I have to be at my desk every evening anyway so you know for my lifestyle it works but this you know I remember a seasons of life where when dad would get home from work he wanted to see our checklist and we had to take it to him <laughs> and show him and I would go oh boy and you know sometimes he'd ask too how was our attitude it wasn't one of the boxes but I think that can 
be encouraging on certain seasons that if you know to have to kind of bring dad in in the process and yeah and that usually started and again it's a different topic but it started about grade seven yeah and when um then I'd say okay we show dad instead of mom yeah yeah and it's not that we didn't show mom but it was just that extra layer of accountability so that can be good yeah that worked for us yeah all right. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk to you a little bit about with planning is that, you know, sometimes people, especially when they're starting out, will be like, oh, well, do I need a schedule or, you know, what time do you start school every day or what time are the kids up and, and have breakfast? And um, if you're interested in more kind of on that topic, Julie Bogart has um, some really, she talks about planning or schedule versus routine and so you could search for that but I maybe will post an article but basically what she talks about and I think it's great is you know I don't have a schedule for our kids in the sense that at 7 a.m. we get up and brush our teeth and at you know 9 a.m. we start our you know that's not we're not in a school and we have the flexibility to have mm -hmm. um, some movement there but we do have a routine and I think it's important to have a routine and it's nice to spend a little bit of time thinking about on a typical day when people haven't gotten sick or thrown up or anything like that, what would you like the flow of your day to be? And so um, I kind of do that every summer. I sort of sit down and think, okay, what would I like the flow of our day to be? And so, you know, we get up and it looks different for every family, but my son is an early, early riser. And when that kind of started, I was mm -hmm. like, oh, like, this is my time. This is my time when everybody's sleeping. But now it's our, my favorite time of the day with him because he's up you know anywhere from an hour to two hours before his sisters and we have all his schoolwork done before sleepyheads even stumble down mm -hmm. so that's in my routine I wake up he's up and then we do his schoolwork so that's our routine and then we do breakfast and then in my plan that I typed up at the beginning of the year we were gonna do morning time because first things have to come first but then I found that I was the younger two after breakfast, they were playing so nicely. So here I was taking two happily independent kids and making them come and sit on the couch with me. Like that's a little ridiculous. So then what evolved was that the two younger ones played really nicely after breakfast. So that was my one on one time with my oldest. And that's when we did things that she needed my help for. And so that wasn't in my plan, but that became our routine. And I think um, that's why it's great to have a plan, but you know, plan for it to be flexible and work with your kids. And I think um, my kids really like knowing typically what comes, you know, after I do one on one time with Naomi, then we do our morning time and then they work on something independently and I go do something with our youngest. And it's just, um, it's not a schedule, it's not by the clock, but it's the typical ebb and flow of our day. And it gives, I think it helps with attitudes and expectations because it's not like, well, what's gonna happen now? Or can I go play now? Can I go play though? No, they know that it's not playtime right now. When we get mm -hmm. up, we get at it. And then playtime is, you know, later in the morning before lunch, so. Mm -hmm. Anyways, I think it's great to take the time to plan it out and then be flexible when you see things that aren't working and just be willing to tweak it. Yeah. So. Yes. Well, that sounds good. I know one of the comment or one of the thing when I was thinking about a goal chart is, and they click it off and things come up. And Carla said, you know, talked about being flexible with your plans because things come up and you don't want to miss fun things. That's mm -hmm. like, I really believe that God brings opportunities uh, and um, that we don't want to miss those when they come up. And so sometimes though they say, oh, I don't have my math done. Well, we're going to go to this person's place for lunch. And so sometimes I would just say to them, like, tell me the answers and I'll write them down and yeah. we'll get, we can get it done in 10 minutes. So it's not wrong to help them to complete their goals. Uh, like, um, and so I think, you know, bear that in mind too. It's fun to say you d you've done something, but help them. And sometimes, uh, whether it's, maybe you can do your spelling um, words on the way there yeah. when you're driving somewhere. So, um, yeah. We have morning time in the car a lot of days. Our morning, I specifically picked our Bible verses that had a CD on song. Mm -hmm. And we've done more memory work in the car this year than just about anywhere else because mm -hmm. we're always on the car at some point during the week. Right. So, 
you know, I think it's, it's good to be flexible and helping them is huge because if you're willing to help them, oftentimes they're a hundred times more motivated to get it done quickly. So. Absolutely. Or do half of the problems. Like I know Naomi, sometimes we'll do half the math problems. Like if you get these ones right, then you don't have to do the other multiplication ones. So do a good job and mm -hmm. it works really well. It's motivating for her. So. Yeah, well, I think we're getting yeah. close. I think we're wrapping up close. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions? I think now if you have any questions, it's a good time. Um, hopefully you can just type them in on your screen there and yeah, that'll work out. Um, I see. Were you going to mention the tools and yes. using the tools? Yeah, okay. okay. So in preparation for doing this um, Facebook Live, I read an article by Sarah McKenzie, who I just, I think she's fabulous. I love everything that she puts out. And um, she wrote an article that um, is called, Planning is Just Guessing. And it was so good because she talked about a little bit what we did about, you know, you want to have a plan so you have a direction to steer the ship, but don't be shocked when things come up and you have to deviate from the plan. She said that instead of um, looking at the curriculum that we purchase as this thing kind of hanging over us that mm -hmm. we feel guilty that we're not using she said think of it as a tool and she said um, what is a tool let's define a tool well a tool is there thank you Natalie we think you're <laughs> awesome too <laughs> um, anyway so Sarah McKenzie said so what is a tool well the tool is there when you need it you pull it out when it's needed so she said you know if your bike breaks and you go to get a wrench she says when you go buy the hammer and the nails and the screwdriver mm -hmm. you don't go oh I feel so guilty that I haven't used this hammer this week or this month or this year you know or oh that screwdriver I spent so much money on it and it's just sitting there you know that's not what the purpose of tools are they're there when we need them and so curriculum is the same thing it's a tool to be used mm -hmm. and there is no law dictating that you have to use it in its entirety or in the scope and sequence that it lays it out you can pull bits and pieces from curriculum and that counts and that has value and you didn't fail by not using the whole book because maybe your child didn't need the whole book maybe mm -hmm. it wasn't relevant and to what you guys were doing or what their needs were. So use your curriculum as a way to help empower you and give you ideas when you need it. But if inspiration has visited and your child is writing a story about wolves, roll with that, use that, you know, don't have the guilt of, oh, well, I bought this curriculum. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know, it's the article, you can Google it, it was plan, um, yeah, planning is just guessing by Sarah McKenzie. So I highly recommend that one. Cool. I see we have a question. Any recommendations for Sim? Um, any recommendations for kids who seem like they are ADHD? I'm guessing it's a boy. <laughs> I don't know that. But yeah, so any recommendations? <clears throat> Absolutely. I have a little boy. He's a cute little guy, smart little fella. But he, we don't, we do things in very short spurts. Yeah. And so we do things for five minutes. And instead of sitting down and having this, long okay now we're gonna do your math now we're gonna do this five minutes all right now why don't you read to me five minutes five minutes <laughs> done and then he goes off and does something and then a little while later hey let's do your copy work five minutes if I made him do those back to back when he was little it would have been too much for him he, it's he's grown in his ability and he's made mm -hmm. the connection now oh well if I do it closer together but if I force the issue he would it would have been a miserable time for us and I think that's for most boys and many many girls too yeah. um on I that show same, something why don't you keep talking yeah, about that with um talking about um needing activity um when our youngest some of you know way hi Sherry Ann, and Brittany um when our youngest well he always was a very active person too yeah. and um so we often started the day with well, in the winter, actually, when Wade was getting uh, uh, older, uh, we went skiing, actually, because we lived about 10 minutes from Canyon Ski Hill. And so some people normally like to do, like to do things in the morning, but he couldn't, or else we went golfing in the summer, because he uh, needed action. And so we would go and get action, and then when he was a little more tired out and could sit long enough, then uh, we would do the, um, some of the things that were sit-down work. Yeah. And um, the other person, before you do that one too, yeah. Carla, is that um, our oldest son, Mark, 
he when he was in grade uh, you know uh, about grade four five and six he would do his work the night before so I say you can't leave your work all day and then do it that night because it's easy not to want to do it but um, then he would do tomorrow's work the night before so and it was a reasonable amount it wouldn't take yeah. him you know maybe took him half an hour uh, when he was grade five and six and so then he would do it the night before he'd get up in the morning he was done he was done the day's work well how happy can you be uh, when you're done that and so I think that's a really for an act, a child that needs um, action yeah. that that that's a really good thing to do another thing is another tip on that I think too is um, uh, trying to get them to read uh, to them lots of times I'd say well you can go to bed now or you can read for 10 minutes or you you know what I mean stuff like that and so they got a lot of reading done uh, when it was meant they didn't have to sleep. Yeah, so. I mean, most kids will do just about anything if it means putting bedtime back a little bit yeah. later. So, and I think just picking things like the explode the code or, you know, looking if you, a uh, younger one, look at the sunlight language arts and just do little bits and pieces. What, let joy be their guide. I'm not saying that mm -hmm. every minute is joy, but if they're truly struggling and just miserable, then, then it's time to back off. Yeah. So, um, I grabbed these, I posted a book on or posted a, sorry a link on Facebook the other day these little photo cubes you can slide things into them and I have used these with my son so much I've got this one right now and you can see he's been working on his learning his doubles so that and we'll use these and he'll I just throw them and catch them and then he says the answer right now I've got on here we were doing some blends so ong and ang and we throw them to each other and he catches them. Sometimes I just pelt them at him and if I hit him, then he has to read them to me. And he loves it and we'll do that for five minutes and then after that he's ready to sit down and do something. Um, we do blast off on the stairs. I'll you know, hold up a sight word and he'll read it and if he gets it right, he gets to jump off the stairs and just, we try to mix it up like that a little bit. So I'm gonna see what Susan. Uh, Susan said, indoor rebounder between subjects, bounce on the large therapy ball. Yes, I have two of those big bouncy balls we use. And oftentimes when I'm doing read-alouds, he'll be bouncing on the ball or building with Legos and stuff like that. So mm. they can do things and they're still absorbing more than you think, I think. So. Yeah, so plan, I guess the other thing is plan to have fun is one thing. Yeah. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Yeah. And um, um, yeah. It is a wise teacher that makes learning a joy. Uh, Daryl used to always say that one, I think, because, um, you know, that was one of my goals, that our kids would have fun, we'd have fun together. And like Carla said, not every minute is fun, but that's life. There are hard times, and you work yeah. through those hard times. And, uh, but uh, plan for fun. Yeah. And, um, and plan for things that interest you. Um, plan for topics that excite you be, and it can be something that you are personally excited about mm -hmm. and that enthusiasm will very often spread to your kids. I got really into the Acadians this year as we did our Canada unit study because it just interested me and before I knew it everybody was excited about <laughs> it and so yeah I think you can go for you know don't worry about doing certain things you know plan for interests and follow those. Mm -hmm. so. I know a, a, a homeschool mom that's um having fun gardening now. Hi, Cassie. <laughs> and um, yeah, so that interest I'm sure is gonna wear off on the kids too as they uh, learn together about gardening. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. And yeah. it's good for them to see, it's good for our kids to see us as adults be excited and learning mm -hmm. new things because it gives them the value that learning is for the whole life. You yeah. know, I learned how to play saxophone this year with my daughter and it was hard for me. But she saw that, you know, I stuck with it and I practiced and I struggled and that was okay. And it, I don't know, it <laughs> inspires them. Yeah. So. No, that's great. Right. Yeah. I think we kind of covered our list. We're so this was fun. To, yeah. And so um, we'd like to thank you all for coming and joining us tonight. Um, one last little statement that I had written down earlier just before was in your planning, I think a big part of it is just to to pray too and pray yeah. and ask God for wisdom. He knows your little people. He made them. <laughs> and, uh, and I just really think that uh, he loves them even more than we do and it's hard to imagine that. But uh, I think that he'll give you some great ideas. So do that and uh, yeah, thanks.
for joining us again. Yeah. And we want to wave goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. All right. We will sign out. Bye.